Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so we're hoping a few more folks will be joining, but uh, we wanted to kick it off. So the webinar today is with our friends at, from Grafana and the topic is why observability matters now and in the future. We do have a few housekeeping items up front. Please note that this call will be recorded. You are all in a listen only mode. So if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A panel. And then we also have a Q&A after the presentations are over. So we can answer your questions then. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please consult the link in the chat. And then we would like to kick it off with a short three question poll so we can tailor today's content to you a little bit better. So that will come up right now and I will give you a few moments to answer those questions. Great, thank you all so much for voting. And it is now my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists today. We have from WeFORKS, Neil Gehani, our product manager, and from Grafana, Carl Burquist, who's principal engineer. And I will hand it over to Neil. Neil, if you would please begin. Thanks, Sonia. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. So as, as everybody knows, uh, we're gonna focus on why observability matters now and in the future. So we're gonna talk about monitoring containerized services. So what the webinar is about uh, today is let's focus on the audience. We're focusing on software development teams and DevOps teams who are building modern software and containers. Uh, we're gonna talk about why monitoring is important we're going to go a little bit into what Weave Cloud Monitor is, uh, primarily for application services monitoring, which is powered by Prometheus. And, uh, and then we're going to how we actually monitor our infrastructure based on Prometheus and Grafana. We'll go into that, and then we'll turn it over to Grafana to talk about Grafana in details. Um, the main, main purpose here is to make sure that um, you know, your company actually wants to deliver value faster and is empowering your teams to own their apps all the way through to production. Uh, so putting your development teams in charge of their own, uh, own software and applications. So as you all know, applications are changing. Uh, speed is everything now. The only way to achieve speed is to deliver small applications as services while applying DevOps practices. DevOps are not tools or processes. They're essentially practices. Modern software teams that are empowered to deliver value faster are the ones that are going to win in the end. You kind of think about it as sort of applying the time value of money principle to software production and delivery. This architecture of building microservices and containers by small two pizza teams, as Amazon calls it, is what makes speed possible. However, when you get to this world of loosely coupled services, rapidly updated, and many, many small applications, you get a new um, matrix from hell. This is, this is really where all these services that are talking to each other, um, and their services are ephemeral, so they can go away. Uh, any resources that are run on it can go away as well. And deploying and monitoring and exploring what's happening with your system when thousands of services and apps that are getting updated all the time is this massive challenge. So the more containers you deploy, the more problems we're gonna have. So we're, we're at the beginning of this huge challenge coming when it comes to monitoring complex distributed systems that have to be built for elasticity, resiliency, uh, where services and resources can disappear at any time. So how will development teams and DevOps teams find and fix problems in this complex system? Teams sharing the same cluster. How will, uh, how will, their, how will they know how their apps are behaving? Besides the best practice, practices around what you should monitor like red metrics, we will show you what needs to be done and the tooling and services that make it easier 
for teams to instrument their apps. Weave Cloud is a one-click SaaS platform for development and DevOps teams. It's powered by Kubernetes and Prometheus. We're building the platform to make it easy for development teams to be in charge of the applications, from deployments to monitoring to exploring your cluster. We're baking in the operational expertise into Weave Cloud. The co-founders were the creators of RabbitMQ. We are funded by Axel and Google Ventures. Kubernetes is becoming the de facto orchestration engine, and Prometheus is the de facto toolkit to build a monitoring and alerting system based on open source, just like Kubernetes. So let's get into talking about monitoring itself. We have three components in Weave Cloud, which is deploy, explore, and monitor. We're going to focus most of this content on the last piece, which is the monitoring piece. So why monitor? The reason you want to monitor is because you want to understand the application behavior as running in this complex system. You want to monitor resource consumption. You want to observe the scaling and performance characteristics. You want to alert and notify when something goes wrong. You want to explore and debug problems with your apps. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, you want to make sure you're constantly delivering reliable value at speed. And that also allows you to help make your apps, continuously improve your apps all the time. You can kind of think about this as sort of a cycle. You're going to deploy something, whether you do it automatic, automated or manual with rollbacks, which we have, we support both modes. Uh, you can also have deployment events uh, metrics correlated onto your monitoring charts. You can observe what's going on. Observe here means you're going to explore, you're going to monitor, you're going to alert, you're going to notify and dig down into the logs for debugging. And then you're going to operate your apps and, uh, on, and resource usage on the clusters like add capacity on demand to scale automatically. So let's go to the next. Now let's take a look at Explore, for example. So here's sort of a visual map of what your cluster looks like. You don't even have to do much. As soon as you install Weave Cloud Agents, it's one kubectl command, and you get to see this cluster right off the bat. You can dig into what's going on, what your kube system looks like. You can zoom in. You can actually go down to the container uh, and, and open up the container and look at the logs. You can also travel back in time uh, to see, to compare states at different points in time of your cluster. So this gives you a very quick way to monitor and explore. Then you can even drill down further and open up your services and look at how these services are connecting to other services. And again, it gives you a much more detailed view and you can drill down to any one of these services uh, and down to the container level. With Monitor, we have a scalable Prometheus as a service effectively. So we have our own dashboards and our own charts out of the box. All you have to do is instrument it, and it's really easy to simple, uh, very simple to instrument. These are curated dashboards that are available for services and allows you to customize the queries or use your own labels to show on the dashboard. You can always use Grafana for more advanced customization and building your own dashboards. For example, for our own Weave Cloud operations, the actual service, our SaaS service that it runs at, we use Grafana for custom dashboards based on some of the metrics that are relevant for operational of the underlying system, which Grafana will get into detail. Instrumenting is very, very easy. All it takes is this piece of code. This is for Node.js app. As you can see, we're using this snippet that you can put into your repo. The app use and the metrics middleware points to the, the bottom part of that code, which is that's allowed you to register all your metrics. Uh, and you can actually embed this into the same snippet up above. So you can put it into one snippet if you want. Um, we, we do it this way for, for us. And you get a whole bunch of metrics out of the box right away. So it's not a lot of work to do that. Of course, Prometheus has all the client libraries that are supported out of the box, all the common ones, and then they also have a whole bunch of uh, third-party libraries. For example, the way we actually implemented Node.js is just go npm install and run that command line, and that sort of allows you to embed the Node.js metrics in there, which you can see. So pretty simple, why we've cloud monitoring for Dev and DevOps teams. It's a scalable and simple solution for open source Prometheus. 
unlike many of the other tools, which are closed source, open source is sort of part of CNCF. It's, it's a trusted community. We get K Kubernetes cluster metrics available out of the box. It's pretty simple. Um, and it's highly recommended for, for Kubernetes workloads. The, uh, it was designed and built really for containerized workloads based on Google's Borgman, who also created Kubernetes. It has great support for service discovery and many of the cloud container platforms. Uh, for example, uh, Kubernetes, Marathon, EC2, Azure, and Zookeeper, et cetera. So it can not only go out and pull metrics, data directly from instances, as they float around your dynamic cluster, but also attach uh, identity metadata as provided by the service discovery to the time series collected for each instance. For example, you may map EC2 tags or Kubernetes labels into your Prometheus time series labels to give you more useful metrics. This is also a way to plug in your own custom service discovery. Uh, Kubernetes exports native Prometheus metrics, uh, has been supporting um, native Prometheus metrics for quite a while now. Here's an example of how we use it internally. So we, we monitor our SaaS apps using Grafana. So Grafana will go into details as to how you edit the source. We just provide uh, the built-in Prometheus providers available in Grafana. And then we can uh, inject a, a query that we want to uh, monitor the metrics for. And then we can see a whole bunch of dashboards using Grafana. We have pre-built some of these uh, operational dashboards that we want to see. Uh, Grafana will go into more details about how, how to use their product. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Neil. <clears throat> if you would please um, pass it on to Carl. I've stopped sharing, so. So let's get started. Uh, yeah, as we talked about earlier, this talk is going to be about uh, Grafana and Prometheus. Um, my name is Carl Bergqvist. I'm a principal engineer at Grafana Labs. So I spend all of my days working on Grafana, GitHub all day. Um, for those of you who don't know Grafana, Grafana is a time series visualization tool. And it focuses only on displaying data, not storing data in any kind, just displaying it. And we support multiple data sources. Uh, I think we support up to 16 right now. Uh, and we ship some built-in Grafana. And one of them is Prometheus. And the core concept of Grafana is this dashboard that you can create. And dashboards are built by panels and rows. So in this case, we see a bunch of graph panels and some single stats panels. Uh, and the single stat panel is like the bread and butter of Grafana. And that's all you want to create. Like the, 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 the graph panel is key. Um, and once you added the graph panel to your dashboard, you can go edit it. And that's when you get this view. And as you can see, you both have the graph and then you also have the query editor. And each data source provides their own query editor. So in this case, we see the Prometheus query editor. Uh, and you can see at, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I can do it like this, yes. Uh, here you can see the query. And we'll just, oops, and we'll just ask for Go routines in the whole system. So then we get um, all the Go routines per servers. And if we dig into the queries a little bit, a little bit more, we have some uh, important features here. Uh, one of them is the legend format. So if you don't supply a legend formatter, you will get this full name, including all labels of your metrics, but you can also get just, just get a job la label. And it's important to keep your like labels and series nice because you're going to build a lot of the dashboards, but, um, and you're going to spend time on it, but you will spend even more time viewing the dashboards. So make sure the data is easy to read and it's easy to communicate. And that's like the 
really important stuff. You can also specify if you want to do an instant query or a range query. Instant query will only return the last value, which might be great for exploring the metrics, but, but it's, you get it, you'll only get one value. As I said earlier, you're gonna spend a lot of time building dashboards. It might not be so fun, but viewing them is way, way, way more important. So make sure to communicate what you really wanna display. And one feature I wanna highlight in the graph panel is the series override, which allows you to specify settings for some series, but not all of them. So in this case, we set all the series named upper night five to the use dots instead of lines which is nice. Uh, you can also specify the data as bar charts instead of um, lines, if you would like. You also have points, and there's like tons of options. I'm not gonna go into all the details. Uh, if you wanna play with it, go to playgrafana.org and you can like tweak all options and you get a live update. One really important feature that we released in 4.6 is the possibility to add annotation in graphs straight in Grafana. So whenever you see something that's misbehaving or something weird, you can add an annotation and then you can look at it in other uh, dashboards and you can go back to viewing. Um, you can also add these annotations using the API or you can read them from another data source like Elastic or something that's more suited for events rather than metrics. The single stat panel is a way more simple panel that allows you to just focus on one number, which is a good way of communicating current state. And that's something you wanna do at like TV monitors and so on, so you can get a quick glimpse on what's the current state and make sure to get it down to understandable numbers um, or <laughs> symbols. Uh, you can specify ranges in the single stat panel saying like from one to 20, then you have a green guy and 20 to 60, you have the orange and above 60, you get a red. And it makes it really obvious and explicit what, what the current state is. Sometimes it's not so nice to have a graph panel, but you'd rather wanna have tabular, uh, tabular data. And that's when we have the table panel. And the table panel allows you to either view the time series as columns or you can do aggregations per series. And then of course you can set thresholds to have the background or the text display in different colors. Uh, we also support plugins, both panel and data sources. And in this case, we were looking at a panel plugin called Diagram which allows you to write uh, basically markup. It's called Myriad, I think, but it's a text representation of a diagram. And then you can connect that to time series, which makes it possible to display your current stack or uh, how your servers are, are related. And then you can connect that to data. So that makes it possible to see that in this case, web one, you have a lot of requests compared to the other uh, web servers. The data is kinda messy. In this case, it's just test data, but it's a much, much better way in some cases to display the metrics this way compared to just numbers to graphs. One of the most powerful feature and something uh, that we get a, people get stuck on quite often is the template variable feature, which allows you to specify one template variable per dashboard that uh, you can use to control all queries using that template variable. So in this case, you can see the drop down at the top where you can tr control which servers you're interested in and all the uh, panels in the dashboards are updated whenever you change it. And the way you do that with Prometheus is that you, you instead of writing the value, you, you use this template placeholder. So you can either use this syntax or this syntax. Both work, it kind of display, display, uh, depends on your query and how, what you prefer. And something uh, that's kind of quirky and where people usually get stuck is, uh, if the, is that they miss this little tilde sign, which makes it only possible to have one option. Uh, and if you have multiple options, Prometheus will not match these. So in the case you wanna view two servers, you get this uh, results, 
you get node one and two. And that's only going to work if you have the tilde sign allowing multiple options. Otherwise, it would look for a server called node bash, um, pipe node two. That's going to give you an empty result, and you're going to be confused about that. Uh, and when you specify template queries, we have some built-in um, functions in Grafana. And this is the most common one. You just ask for label values for the label job, and it will return a list of possible label values for that label. And you can also uh, make sure it only look for uh, labels for a certain time series. So in this case, we only look for label values in the uptime series in the job, call jobs. And you can also ask for time series. So this will give you a list of time series. If you're not sure which um, metrics you're looking for, you might display a dropdown of all node uh, disk metrics, and then you can go on and uh, update the dashboard and check around and see what, if you find anything interesting. Whenever you save a dashboard, we save every version. So in Grafana, we have every version of your dashboard stored in the backend. And if you want to restore an old version, you can just go to the version history. You can select, um, you can restore with a button on the right, or you can select two versions and compare them. Then you see exactly what, happened, what changed in his dashboard in his dashboard version. And this is quite powerful to uh, when you want to go back and see why someone changed a certain behavior. Or maybe they did it by mistake. And this enables you to make sure they had a reason for doing it. And uh, whenever you change it, you are supposed to give a note. Uh, you might not do it, and it would just be blank. Just hit enter and you skip it. But make sure to do it in your production system. If you can't find the time to build all the dashboard, uh, we host a lot of dashboards, uh, pre-built dashboards on grafana.com. So you can go there and then you can search, filter with uh, or filter on Prometheus, and then you can scroll through the long list of dashboards that might be suited for your products. That's it for me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carl. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Neil. Really appreciate it. So we do have a few questions that came in. So I would like to kick off some Q&A with both of you. Um, so let's maybe start with some that are coming in around the Grafana configuration. There were a few questions around how is Grafana configured, what comes out of the box. So maybe, Carl, you can take a few moments to speak to that, please. Carl, I think you muted. You might have to unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, sorry. So the first question is, uh, is this conf Grafana configuration default? Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, the, the looks of it is uh, all by default. Uh, it, the UI changes a little bit uh, depending on version, but um, most uh, of the UI is the same regarding, uh, regardless of configuration. Great, thank you. And then we had a follow-up question around that um, concerning version control with Grafana configuration. Could you both take a moment and speak towards version control um, for the Grafana config as I've recommended, or how would you go about that? Mm. So, it, yeah, I mean, generally for um, anything you want to make changes to in your system, we highly recommend that you actually version control them. And one of the big advantages of actually um, version controlling them is that you can check the states uh, for any of the components. Like in, in our case, we version control everything for, from deployments, uh, into, including our monitoring configurations, um, because we can check the state at any given time about what, what, you, what your desired state is versus what's running in production. So having them uh, in Git uh, as version controls allows us to move from not just DevOps, but we can move to a sort of a GitOps-based model where development teams are very familiar with how to do Git and pull-based, uh, you know, pull-based ops, uh, pull-request-based ops. And so this gives, this gives us 
uh, the ability and gives the teams the ability to to make sure that everything is is version controlled. Thank you, Neil. Carl, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I think you're, uh, Neil is absolutely right. Uh, I think there's two schools to it. The, uh, the people who want to use Git for everything and those who are fine with other means. Um, I'm actually in the Git camp, even though Grafana right now doesn't have good support for it. But we're looking into different solutions for that. Uh, I know that WeWorks have open sourced a code called Grafana Lib, which is open source, and it's a way to write your dashboards in Python and then have them uh, stored in Git. And I think that's a good tool. Um, we're looking into different solutions for how we want to enable the same behavior in Grafana, but uh, currently we don't have like the official solution yet. Great, thank you. Um, maybe we'll hop over into some of the questions around analytics. What comes out of the box with Prometheus? And then how do I go about actually choosing a set of analytics to get started with? So um, you get a whole bunch of metrics and it's pretty easy to see if you go to the Prometheus uh, website, they, they'll, they'll show you all the metrics that come, comes out. One of, the, one of the things that we uh, highly recommend is, is, the, is choosing the red method which is the, uh, the requests per second, the error rate, and the duration. And those things actually come out of, you know, we didn't invent them. Their basis for that is uh, coming out of what, what Google did, the four, uh, the four signals, uh, the golden rule uh, that Google actually talked about. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, there's a blog post on that on our website. But you get all these metrics like uh, coming out of the box really, really simply. And, and it's then up to you to choose like what you really want to monitor. And one of the best practices we recommend is to just focus on red first because that, that will actually get you started uh, to monitoring your services really well. Thank you, Neil. Carl, would you like to add something to that? Sure, uh, I think the red method as Neil described is a excellent starting point. But uh, I wanna highlight that uh, as an uh, expert in the product you're working on, you're the expert at deciding and finding the right metrics to monitor. Um, Google has their four golden signals, which is also a great starting point. But they are just starting point because who, you who develop your app and your system, you're the expert at what's important for your company. And you, the best thing is to align uh, what you're monitoring with what the business really, really want to see working. Because that's when you get the best monitoring, I think. When you can focus on business monitoring and not just server monitoring. Thank you, Carl. That's actually a really interesting point. Um, maybe you can actually take a little bit of time to talk about you know, continuous improvement as an outcome of monitoring. I think Neil alluded to that in his slides. Um, how do you do that today, um, basically, or, or how would you get started? How could a team get started around that? That you use maybe user-centric alerting? Is that what you were referring to? Go. Yeah, I, I, sorry, but I think I just missed that question. Oh, no problem. I was referring to continuous improvement as one of the outcomes of monitoring. You just alluded to that in terms of you should focus on the business, right? So maybe yeah. you can give a few pointers around that. How could you get a team started on that? You know, is it maybe someone around user-centric alerting? Can you be proactive? Or maybe you have a few starting tips for folks. Um, when it comes to the business transformation uh, regarding DevOps and so, I'm not the strongest um, person, but uh, I think it's really important to do the white box monitoring where you can uh, actually try to find problems before the real problems arises. So if your business metrics and uh, uh, key performance um, indicators, these might be your black box uh, metrics like sales and so on. 
So you want to uh, firstly, uh, you want to you want to focus on that, uh, of course, but make sure to have all the white box monitoring, like internal metrics of your services, to make sure that these uh, important metrics are not violated. Yeah, I think it's. I think what Carl is referring to is it's important to know when you're when you're in charge, uh, your teams are in charge services, then you're going to be in the best position to know what you should uh, look at. And those metrics sort of feed into the broader KPIs, the business KPIs. So it's the underlying metrics that actually drive the KPIs or moves the needle. It's, it's also to get started. It's, uh, you know, it's important to have a team that's actually empowered uh, to do that, uh, a team that, in, that owns the service all the way into production. Um, and that is a more of an organizational issue rather than a technology or a tool issue. Um, the tools are there. Uh, it's provided by us, provided by Grafana, provided by a whole bunch of other people uh, that will get you there. But at the end, end of the day, it's, it's, uh, it's how you organize your teams to deliver value at speed you know, for, for your users. That's going to matter more than anything else in the world. And that, that's something that will get you to deliver that value much, much faster to your users. Great, thank you so much. And then maybe a last question um, for both of you. Um, I think a lot of companies do have already an app monitoring tool in place, right? Um, might that be maybe for the server side, might that be maybe for the business side? So, I mean, you both were actually referring to Prometheus quite a bit as, as one of the solutions that both companies are heavily involved with. Why would you actually make the effort to move over to Prometheus? Well, for one thing, many of those monitoring uh, tools are basically closed source. Um, so one of, the, one of the richness of Prometheus is that it's, it's actually very simple, it's very fast, um, and the instrumentation is a lot easier. You don't have to actually go, uh, you know, an instrument for every single metric. There is just like the metrics that come out of the box, as I showed in my slide, like to do for your Node.js application, it's a very simple instrumentation that you have to do. Um, so that, and it's also sort of supported by the, by the uh, CNCS, which, CNCF, which is where both Prometheus and Kubernetes uh, are supported by, by the standards bodies. And this is sort of becoming the de facto way for people to monitor their, their workloads, not only in the, the Kubernetes system itself, which, uh, which supports Prometheus out of the box, but the services and the workloads that are running um, on Kubernetes. So you get all of those benefits um, out of the box. You can certainly extend them. Um, and so you're not locked into any one particular monitoring solution. The nice thing about Prometheus is, is that it's very extensible and you can do a lot of custom metrics on your own um, and tag them. So that, that's a big advantage. Yeah, um, I think the biggest change, uh, if we look at the current monitoring tool like Prometheus and monitoring tool that uh, was very successful five years ago or something like that, is the fact that these tools use to focus on server monitoring. While today, when we're moving so fast and we have a complete different stack where servers are rather expected to fail uh, than be alive all the time, um, then we're have to switch focus from monitoring servers to monitoring services. And since Prometheus is so great that combining application metrics and node metrics and container metrics in one system, it's really easy to create uh, alerts and it's really easy to create dashboards and visualizations around these metrics because they're always, uh, uh, there's, yeah, because they're always in one place. Switching from server monitoring to service monitoring is key uh, when you're building dynamic systems with Kubernetes and so on. Yeah, that, that's right, Carl. I think that's, that's, that's a great way to think about it is that you're moving from uh, the, the servers all the way to services. And now most people are focused on like, hey, how's my services doing running in this cluster? And having that yeah. full context is very important. Because yeah. if you think about it, if one server dies, do you really care? Do you even know how many services you have right now? Probably not. You want to make sure to deliver a great service.
Great, thank you so much both to you. And then one fun question at the end. Um, actually, um, a participant is asking what conferences you both recommend around topics like that. Well, obviously there's, there's, there's definitely KubeCon. So if, uh, if you're interested in Kubernetes, given the poll, like ma many people were, were focused on Kubernetes or a very large majority of them. So, you know, if you go to KubeCon, uh, um, or, and there's also AWS reInvent uh, coming up, we're gonna be there. So come talk to us if you wanna find out more details. Um, but those are the ones you go to. There's a Prometheus, uh, if you're interested in that, I think there's Prometheus conferences but they're easy to find. Um, I think if you Google search them, you'll, you'll find a lot of those things uh, online. Uh, yeah, I would de definitely recommend KubeCon. Uh, I'm probably gonna be at the European one in May, and we're also hosting a Grafana conference in March in Amsterdam. Then we have a Monostrama before the summer, uh, in Portland, great conference, uh, yearly conference about just monitoring three days. And Prometheus, the, the prom, Prometheus Con, PromCon conference is usually in August every year. Um, uh, that's a gr really great conference as well. That would be like the top four conferences in my world. Wonderful, thank you so much. Well, thanks again to both of you for taking the time today. And we're gonna make the recording of the webinar available to everybody and also the slides. Um, and then please feel free to follow us on Twitter, Reforx and Grafana, we're both there. If you have more questions, just tweet at us and we'll make sure that your questions get answered. Thank you so much again. Have a great day, bye-bye. <laughs>